son in the house today. I just feel like there is a spirit of, I don't know, recreation. Don't you love that word, recreation? Recreation. And so God is always rejuvenating us when we get in his presence. And, man, we love worship at the Abbey, but we also love the word. And I'm believing that the same kind of a, you know how in worship here you can just swim around in it? Have you had that experience? I want you to sit back and relax and swim around it in it during the preaching of the word like you do in worship. Because this too is worship. So it's not like we transition into the studious part. Oh, our brains can get involved. I mean, you know I'm going to take you there. But, <laughs> but I still, it's a flow. So rivers of words can wash over you. And I'm just believing for God to show up. So go ahead. We're still on Move Your Mountains. But today, I'm going to bring it back to, anybody remember living unstuck? Moving your mountains, getting unstuck, living unstuck. Now, last week, how many of you were here? When is your mountain not a mountain? When your perspective shifts. Do you remember when Matt taught us that last week, and he showed us all the different perspectives of the, uh, the, even the man who owned the house when the people cut a hole in the roof? And very cleverly, Matt said, that was kind of vandalism. And uh, some of you got that. I thought that was, uh, someone mentioned, you know, Donna Summers, her whole world is property management. She manages, she oversees the management of properties all over the nation. It's a big deal. There's a lot of stucco and steel and things involved in her life. And uh, Matt noticed that when he said, from the perspective of the homeowner, that was vandalism, Donna loved that. She was thinking on the value side of what happened there. Isn't that great? Listen, we all have perspectives. That's the beauty of the body of Christ is that all our perspectives can meet in him, and it takes all of us and all of our viewpoints to fully represent who he is. However, we can also be goofed up in our perspectives. Have you experienced that? I'll be the first to say I so have. And nothing is better than when the Holy Spirit comes and adjusts our perspectives. And so that's what we're about today. All year long, we've been talking about getting unstuck. All year long. How many of you are so connected to that theme still? I just want to give you a dose of reconnection and a challenge. I love this picture because it really reminds us that sometimes we're either wearing the wrong glasses or not wearing the right glasses to see straight. And I believe today's an end of the year challenge. I know we're about to roll into the holidays and I know we're going to get busy, but I really believe the Holy Spirit wants to wake us up this morning to the fact there's still business for him to do before January 1. And we don't just pick these themes for good advertisement. We're not just looking for what goes on a t-shirt. We're trying to hear from heaven what God is saying to a corporate group of people. And so even if you joined us late this year, what you joined was a corporate group living into unstuckness, getting unstuck, having the energy of heaven, moving you forward into the purposes of God and not getting sidetracked along the way. So if there's going to be encouragement along those lines today, God's been shifting our perspective all year long. So this is my favorite not my favorite biblical painting, it's just the painting I found on the internet, of my favorite biblical picture of stuckness. This is the man at the pool of Bethesda in John 5, verses 1 through 9. I'll read it to you briefly because this is where we're going to be camping out today. Because this man was stuck. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, how many of you know sheep? And the metaphor of pastoring, sheep are people, and Jesus is the good shepherd, and so pastors are shepherds. So the sheep gate, to me, reads like the gate where all the people are. And how many of you have been around the people? Have you been to Target lately? Is anybody afraid to go out on Black Friday? I did it once, and we went home and opened our computers. People. People. <laughs> The sheep gate would have been a messy gate. There is by the sheep gate a pool, which in the Hebrew is called Bethesda, which means house of mercy, having five porticos.
porticos, that's also translated colonnades or porches. And five is the number of, say it with me, grace. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered. That implies neurological disorders. Waiting for the moving of the waters. Now, the next statements I'm going to read you are not in the original and most reliable manuscripts. So there's some old manuscripts. The Bible is the inspired word of God, the originals. And this statement may have been added later. For the, an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water, and whoever then first stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. That bit is not in the original manuscripts, okay? Just telling you, it's in brackets in a lot of your Bibles for that reason. A man who, now we're back to what every scholar agrees on. A man who was there had been ill for 38 years. That's stuck. 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? Maybe he was reawakening desire in him. Because after 38 years, you might have lost some desire, do you think? The sick man answered him. This is fascinating. Sir, he said, do you want to get well? And in, immediately the sick man answers his way. He said, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps in before me. Wow, isn't that sad? Is that accurate? Yes. That was an accurate assessment by the man of his own situation. Is that complete? No. And it didn't answer the question, did it? It didn't answer Jesus' question. Jesus said to him, Jesus said to him, okay, so he, this is really an odd conversation. He said, do you want to get well? He said, I have no one to put me in the water. Someone gets in first. And Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. That's it. And the man immediately picked up his pallet and was healed immediately what what <laughs> that's the most this miracle stands out because it's one of the few where it's not noted that anybody's faith was involved other than Jesus's I think it's no accident that it happened on a place with five grace porches because I think Jesus was demonstrating the extreme of his grace it doesn't tell us anywhere that and we don't have any evidence that any of this man's faith was involved so this is a freeing thing to realize that it's not just about our faith. It's his initiative. I mean, technically, listen, we do one-on-one -on -one prayer sessions around here with people, and if you were praying with somebody and you said, let me ask you, do you want to be well? And they said all that, you would go in for the man. You'd start going, okay, well, I, you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that was like an answer that revealed a lot of mess. But Jesus did not disqualify the man from his healing because of his bad answer. He didn't disqualify him for any reason. And we've got to wake up and realize he has not got a checklist of I'll heal you when. He does not have that checklist. It's not the way our father works. Now, this man had done the math. Can you see that dog? Says, I did the math. We can't afford the cat. I'm sure there's a meme somewhere with a cat saying, can't afford the dog. This man had done the math for 38 years. He was stuck in so many of his own perspectives. Note, Jesus was, it's clearly a conversation of two different perspectives. Jesus didn't even acknowledge the man's. He just flowed from his. Jesus saw him as unstuck, and he observed him that way and pulled that healing into manifestation. Jesus knew he had to lead the man into a reality beyond the mere math. How many of you have done the math sometimes in your situation? Have you ever had a situation and you do the math, and I don't even mean just financial. I mean you just go, here's the facts, I'm a reasonable person, it's over. <laughs> Can I tell you there's a God beyond the math? Can I tell you that even in math there are multiple dimensions? There's math beyond your math. There's math beyond mathematicians' math. Do you know they're still doing research in math? There are new discoveries in math. I take the science news on my internet inbox. I know. I read them. They're, they're geeky and amazing, and sometimes they're 
sometimes even I don't care. But there's no mere math. Your situation is not what your brain thinks it is ever. It's maybe accurate in the math it has, but it's not complete. So here's several of the man's stuck perceptions. Number one, he had an orphan spirit, so his math was always going to be flawed. There was a huge missing piece of the formula. He saw himself alone, as evidenced in the words, Sir, I have no man. Now, it's terrible to feel alone, and that's a very real feeling. But he had a heavenly father he did not yet know about, and a family connected to that heavenly father. So do you. He was stuck in his methodology. He clearly thought the only way to be healed was for someone to put him in the bubbly water. Think of it. Up walks the Son of God, and this man undoubtedly thinks, Are you my person? Which only meant to him... Are you the one that's going to finally get me in that water first? I don't know if that blows your mind, but it blew mine when I really took it in. I thought, the Son of God, the creator of the world, walks up to him, and he's like, you going to put me in? You going to put me in that bubbly water over there? What? And Jesus shows the other way, clearly. But imagine where that man, that's the ludicrousness of our incomplete math when we're not factoring him in. He had locked down his system to his own experience and made his bed in his conclusions. Have you ever made your bed in conclusions? I have, and it is a miserable mattress to lie on. Listen, sometimes, you know the story of the princess and the peas, one of my favorites, because sometimes we think we've made our bed in God loves me and all's well and good promises, but there's something we hadn't dealt with down there like a pea under the 36 mattresses and going too far here with the fairy tale but with no apologies, you are royalty. That was the point. And you were made for a smooth, not a bumpy sleep. And so when we don't factor in the goodness of God and when we camp out on it, we are stuck. Again, I'm going to go back to this. You can tell I love this doing the math metaphor, but can I just tell you, Even a genius gets the math wrong sometimes. There are documented cases of of math geniuses. And you know so often, and I do this, so often where they miss it are the simple things. I one time had had a straight 100 in a graduate school course in statistics. And on the last test, I just had an arithmetic error. That make you crazy. 98 or something, but... It was so stupid. But that's what I'm trying to tell you. Our brains are never going to be enough to run our lives by themselves. They need our spirit. Our brains were made to let our spirit flow through. So this morning, some of you, the shift of perspective may be back to spirit-dominated thinking. Will you let God into your math this morning? Would you admit that maybe one of your formulas is flawed? Would you admit that maybe you got some big things right? We know you have revelation and understanding. But if there's an area you feel orphaned, you have multiplied wrong somewhere. See, I know the end of it, so I'm smiling more. I'm happier. And I'm trusting I'm going to bring you into that joy by the end. I know where we're going, and I'm super excited about it. But where the world says, you made your bed, now lie in it, Jesus says, rise take up your bed and walk so it doesn't matter what you bedded down in that was wrong Jesus is calling out to you the man did not yet recognize who was coming to him he thought it was maybe just a random person that could put it in the water put him in the bubbly water so there's a principle of recognition here you see it in Luke 19 42 where Jesus weeps over Jerusalem and he said to Jerusalem If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for your peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. In another place, Luke 19, well, two verses later, he's continuing to lament over Jerusalem, and he says devastation is going to befall because you did not recognize the season of your visitation. You can't receive what you don't recognize. So if you recognize Jesus as Savior, you'll receive him as Savior. But if you don't recognize him as healer, that part's closed off to you. It's there. It's real. 
but you can't receive what you don't recognize because there is a part you play not in doing it but in engaging with it it reminds me of this story in mark 6 verses 49 and 50 and this is where jesus came walking they're in a storm on a boat and he could see that they were struggling so about the fourth watch of the night jesus went out to them walking on the sea and this is interesting it says he intended to pass by them i don't have revelation on that i don't know why he intended to pass by them But I'll be thinking about that in the days to come. But when they saw him walking out on the sea, now these are the disciples that hung out with Jesus, they cried out thinking he was a ghost. For they all saw him and were terrified. But Jesus spoke up at once, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Isn't that interesting? His visual appearance didn't comfort them, but his voice did when they heard his voice. But isn't that funny i find it comical that they thought he was a ghost they'd been hanging out with him watching him do miracles but he walked on the sea and they went oh that's too far that can't be him (laughs) the only thing they got right was the spiritual aspect at least they were thinking spiritual they were thinking you can't walk on water in the natural so this is something spiritual but isn't that sad that the minute we think spiritual we go straight to the dark side When in fact, that's just a perversion of the real deal. There's a whole spiritual world that's the bright side, the God side, the heaven side. So don't you know the enemy wants to get us hung up on, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. Or maybe you've wandered in this church and you're like, I don't think they might be those charismatic, uh, tonguey, talkery people I'm a little scared of. And uh, isn't that also just, what that is, is we're just so scared of what we can't see And so the enemy camps out on it and goes, well, watch a Halloween movie. By the way, as Paul was waving his phone up here doing the offering, uh, I was watching his credit cards go up and down. Did anyone besides me see that? I just, it's, yeah, several, I don't know why that seemed funny to me. Um, But I thought I'd tell you our Halloween story. On Halloween night, I forced us to stay away from the house uh, because we didn't have any to we didn't have tracts to hand out or we didn't yeah we weren't prepared or anything you know and um and I had a feeling we live in a neighborhood that would have lots of people wandering and so it did so we went where all the people who live in our area go uh we went to Kroger and so (laughs) we wandered the aisles of Kroger for a while and put a few things in our baskets and then we came home it was dark it was thinning out and we thought our dog wouldn't be barking at all the trick-or-treaters. Uh, we get in, and I hear a s- sort of a cry. It wasn't, it is a ghost. It was a cry, though, from Paul. And I, and I hear him run out the door because he was searching his car, our car. He realized he left his phone in the shopping cart at Kroger <laughs> with that phone, with the, with the credit cards. <laughs> and so it, what, ha- what happened was we had a... We drove back to Kroger, and we had a pop-up community group of all the board Kroger employees. They were lovely. Shout out to Bailey Boswell Kroger. They had nothing to do because it was Halloween. And so all of them helped us, and finally, and it was about an hour, and finally one of them said, let me have your number. We only had my phone, and I was going throughout the store asking people, and we searched every card, and one of them called his phone, and the trash can outside the store rang. And all they took was $100 from pastor appreciation that he had cash in there, and they left the other stuff. Fascinating, right? That was our, I don't know why, I I thought it was kind of funny. In the end of the day, it was funny. It was funny because it had a good ending. That's why it was funny. But you know, now I'm going to cleverly segue into the next slide. Watch this. Here's the deal. That night, oh, I was wandering out in the Kroger going, excuse me, did you find a phone in your cart? To only the small carts, because we knew we had a small cart. And all of a sudden, on the loudspeaker I, of Kroger, I hear, Perry Ann, would you please come to the front? <laughs> and I knew at that moment he'd found, somebody had found his phone. I knew it was over. <laughs> my, <laughs> my senses were enlightened when I heard my name on the intercom. <laughs> I was like, yes, Lord, I will come to the front. <laughs> and that is not a very good segue but yet it is a segue to the next slide what i heard the lord say uh, about this morning is it's a word for us it is time to widen your aperture 
Now, an aperture is an opening, any opening, but as a camera term, what it is is the part of the lens that opens or closes to let more or less light in. That's what an aperture is. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Just like the pupil of your eye, which opens and closes to a vary uh, the amount of light hitting your retina. All lenses feature apertures. Listen to this. The size of the aperture is set by you. It's adjustable and you set the aperture. I'm making the spiritual analogy here. You, are, you have lenses that you view life through. And even if your lens is flawed, you still can let more light in. You're the one that widens or closes your aperture. When you get hurt or disappointed, our tendency in the flesh is to close. Well, I thought God would do this, but maybe he'll only do this. When they called my name on the speaker at Kroger, Perry Ann, would you come to the front? The circumstance made me go, oh, thank God it's found. God is good. But you know what? If that phone had been totally gone and those credit cards gone and we driver's license and we spent the next day chasing all that down, how bad would that be? But then I still would have had the option to widen my aperture. And I knew that night, before we had the phone restored, I knew, Perrin, you're going to have to make a choice in advance that if tomorrow brings (laughs) all that mess and if we don't have this, and we have to shut it all down and deal with all that stuff, God is still on our side. God is still bigger. While the minimum aperture available isn't so much of an issue for the photographers, the maximum one is. This is because the more light a lens can let in, the greater flexibility you have as a photographer. I'm just going to take that and say the more light you let in, the greater flexibility you have as a person in the spirit realm. Allowing you to use faster shutter speeds when light levels are low. What does that mean? To me in the spirit, that means there's times life is dim, but if you are letting the light of God in, you can see the truth quickly. You can go, what's going on here? Ah, I see, Lord. I see how to pray. I see how to deal as well as harnessing the creative benefits this brings. The size of the aperture also enables you to control the depth of field in an image. If you want to blur the background, widen your aperture. Now I want to tell you the background in your life sometimes is nothing but distracting. And you need to focus on what God is saying, the subject of of his dealings with you there's a term photographers use called wide open the term wide open literally means max out the aperture of the lens wide open shoot wide open is a term photographers use this means that they're saying let in all the light you can forget the depth of field and focus on the thing widen your aperture I believe that's a challenge to us today, and that's definitely what Jesus was doing for the man at the pool of Bethesda. You can tell, that's a beautiful slide, you can tell I geeked out on a thing when I have not one but two, and that one's less beautiful. And I'm not going to read all that to you, but I just wanted to say, on the one side over here, it's just that top thing, and it says, why use a small aperture? To increase the depth of field, bring the whole scene in equal focus, and it lets in less light. Are there times you need to focus in maybe and see the whole big picture? Are are there times you need to actually do the math? Sure, especially if it's related to the practical matters. Nothing wrong with that. But then, why use a wide aperture? Because you still need a bath of light. And there are times you need to blur that distracting background. You need to open up so you can see the subject. It said, uh, keep the background nicely blurred to focus in on the subject. Can I just tell you, I'm advocating for living with the background noise in your life nicely blurred. You don't have to tune it all the way out. What would I mean by background noise? That would be like people saying yucky things to you. That is just background noise. Is it going to help you to focus in on that? No. You do not need that depth of field. You need to let that be just blurry background noise. 
But if God said something to you and people say different, you're not obligated to factor in what they say to your math. Then it says, why would you use a wide aperture? To isolate an object from a distracting background. Some of you need to, tomorrow morning, wherever you go to pray, whether it's driving, in a chair, wherever you are, some of you need to consciously go, Lord, widen my aperture and let that background that's distracting you, it won't go away, but it can get blurry and you can see clearly again the subject. And the subject is God and his work in you. So to summarize that little bit, I'll just say, we all view life through lenses that experience has given us. You know, your version of reality is not the whole version of reality. It's your version. God wants to get involved in it. We might not always need to reconstruct the whole lens, but we can always widen the aperture. What happened to you happened to you. You don't have to pretend it didn't or try to undo it. And sometimes even though we pray over the past, we get so lost in that we're, that we're stuck in the past. You might not always need to go back and do that, but you can always let more light in. You can always widen the aperture. We can take in more light to wash our situation with heaven's view of us. Loved, this is heaven's view. Loved, cherished, provided for, not alone, whole, resourced. In other words, not an orphan. That's heaven's view of you. When we do this, it will blur the background and restore our focus on the real subject. This is the real subject. The goodness of God expressed in our lives. Not just expressed in heaven, but expressed on earth through us. Okay, here's a contrasting story in the Old Testament. This is Naaman the Syrian, and this is in 2 Kings 5, 1 through 14. I'm not going to read it. Many of you know it. Naaman was a leper, and he heard of Elisha the prophet, and he wanted to be healed, and he goes to Elisha's house, and Elisha won't even come outside. He just sends word, tell him to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. Naaman protests, saying, well, we have rivers. Why the Jordan? It's kind of dirty. I don't like that river. He doesn't want to do it. And he says, besides that, I'm an important man. Why didn't he come out? And he didn't want to do it. And one of his servants says, but if he'd asked a hard thing, you would have done it. And he humbles himself, and he goes and dips in the river seven times and is healed. It says the fle his flesh is clean and new like a child's, a leper healed. Okay, the man at the pool of Bethesda was trying to get in the bubbly water, and Jesus went, rise, take up your mat and walk, not necessary. Now here we have an opposite story where he just wanted a word, and here the prophet said, go dip seven times. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Now a lot is preached about this, about humility and obedience. I even think there might be an Old versus New Testament thing going on, maybe. But here's what I think is the real point. Obedience and humility, yes, it did take obedience and humility. But there's also a bigger message here. Naaman was learning the same lesson as this man at the pool of Bethesda, but in the opposite way. Here's the lesson. God has multiple delivery systems for your miracle. I don't believe it was, as, it was about obedience. Everything's always, you got to do it. But I really believe he was trying to expand this captain's mind. This captain did everything with a word. And he's saying, I got more delivery systems than you know of. And that's what he was saying to the man at the pool of Bethesda too. Uh, widen your aperture. Let some more light through your lens and lose the distracting background story. That makes me excited. Here's, the, here's grace. It never begins or ends with us, though we do cooperate. We press in to get to him but it's really getting past our separateness is what we're pressing into. It is never a contest between ourselves and others. Grace is a family experience. It's not going to be who can get in the water first. It's a family experience. Like Matt said last week, there's help, there's friendship, there's people together. Moving your mountain is not, is not someday, it's now. Jesus helped the man at the pool see that his mountain-moving moment wasn't in the waters of the pool, but in his interaction with some new and living waters. And the man, whoops, the man did have to cooperate. That says it all. 
if you'd been lying there 38 years and Jesus says to you, rise, take up your bed and walk, how many of you know that's a little bit of a change to your situation? There was a cooperation on the man's part. Have you ever thought about the man could have gone, could you just pick me up? That seems funny, but how many of you have been in a state where you, you thought, oh, I don't even know that I can get up off this bed. He did act. He did respond. I believe in it's all God, and we're going to say a little more about that in a minute. We do cooperate, though, on our side. So we see a relationship here. As I said before, this uh, pool of Bethesda, <coughs> Bethesda means the house of mercy, but we've said it's a place of God's grace, these five porches and colonnades. Uh, which, so we've got this contrast between ha- the house of mercy and this concept of grace. The purpose, can I submit to you, the purpose of God's grace is to shift your system beyond just mercy and into the grace that came because of God's mercy. Mercy is a great beginning. Mercy gets you in the ballpark but grace hits the home run that wins the game. God's mercy is that we're just even breathing. God's mercy is all over us. I don't ever want to take his mercy for granted. I'm thankful for his mercy. But did you know his grace wants to lift you in a place where you're not always in need of mercy? That's where we're headed. I mean, we'll still need it. Oh, there's times recently that I've been like, have mercy, I'm not performing well. And he's good. But in his mercy, he comes with grace, and he empowers me. He doesn't just go, bless your heart, I still love you. <laughs> you're still cute. <laughs> I love you, Bill Perry Ann, you're cute. He goes, be empowered. He goes, remember who you are. He strengthens the grace inside us. So, mercy, here's a great definition. Mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's own power to punish or harm them. Grace is so much more than that. Grace put the punishment on Christ, on us in Christ, and came out the other side. So I did a little, when I was reading about this, uh, I found out, I love this term. This is a Catholic term, it's a Latin term, that describes how grace comes to us. And I just love this term. It's called ex opere operato, which sounds like an opera, but it's not. What it means is from the work performed. But if you're a Catholic church scholar, you would have argued or discussed all the ways it could come, all which work performed. So at the top it says from the sacraments. And listen, I'm not picking on Catholics today because whether we put it in Latin or not, we all argue over how we get this. Okay? So we get mixed up in works versus grace. There is a work performed. From the sacraments, or this is scary, from the virtue of the minister or recipient of the sacraments. That has a little asterisk. We'll get back to that. Or from the capital S source. That was my wording. So what I want to submit to you is the only valid place to get grace, ex opere operato, from the work performed, is from the source, from the cross. Everything points to the cross. That little asterisk says, uh, so long as no obex is present. I did not know this term. It's fascinating. So... It's saying, from the virtue of the minister or recipient of the sacraments. In other words, if the minister's all clean and good, and then if you trying to receive it are all clean and good, as long as there's no obex. So let me tell you what an obex is. Don't you think it's fun? Y'all can talk about this over lunch. Go, let's, let's talk about obexes. Obi, I don't know. Uh, it's the Latin, obex is the, listen to this, it's the Latin word for barrier. And it means, now go with me here, because again, I'm not picking on Catholicism. We may not put Latin to it, but charismatics do just as bad thinking you didn't hold your mouth right so you didn't get healed. Come on, we're out to kill it. Any obstacle, here's what an obex is, any obstacle in the recipient that would prevent a sacrament from producing the supernatural effect for which the sacrament was instituted. These obstacles are mainly a lack of faith, 
or of the state of grace or of a worthy intention will kill us all, man. Did, did, did y'all hear that? In other words, it's saying if, you don't, if you're not already perfect, you can't receive the perfect. Listen, how sad is that? It's saying that it's listing human reasoning. In other words, somebody did the math. And they said, well, they didn't get healed. They didn't receive. The supernatural didn't come. So their heart's not right. Their intentions were wrong. All these lists of things to which the cross is the only remedy. So they're saying you didn't receive from the cross because you weren't already right in the way the cross wants to make you. You have no hope. So you have to live in a system of works. Because there's no, if you can't start with complete helplessness and walk in that complete helplessness to the cross and stand there and go, I got nothing, you have no hope. So when we say that grace is by the work performed, I am declaring for you it is none of your work. It is none of your work. Through the centuries let this resound that the cross splits apart people's efforts to please God. It's his doing. It's his idea. And if you are in a mess, oh, by the way, guess where the term obex is also used? It's a part of the brain. You know what that tells me? Every time we put up barriers between man and God, we're just reasoning. We're just doing math in our natural brains. Yes, there are things to fix in us. Yes, there are things we're doing wrong. Yes, we have barriers in our lives, but the fixing of those barriers comes from the cross outward, not from out here to the cross. And you cannot get too far away from this or you'll get lost. And God doesn't want you lost. Okay, I am, yeah, I have just about the right amount of time. I, I want to go on a deep dive for the time we have left because I really feel some of you woke up this morning and thought, I really need to learn a new Greek concept today. <laughs> Let's go a level deeper looking at the story in John 5. This is from an article. I'm just going to be honest. I check this with my husband. I really do check things with him when they're on the edge. It's always bothered me, this bubbly water business. Those lines that the translators included have always bothered me because the God I know doesn't go, whoever's in first gets healed. And the translators wrote, some translators added that part that said, what well, was an angel of the Lord that did that? So all my life this has been a question. And I am, I am picky about scholarship. So just because one dude on the internet has a theory, one dude who prays in tongues writes a theory is not enough for me. I'm looking for scholarship because I care. And this week, I finally found this. I'm not telling you you have to agree with me, but I'm telling you there's some principles of truth here that you will be shouting, I believe. This article is called The Pool of Bethesda as Greek Asclepion, which I know you're going, whoa, really? Like if you're channel surfing and that documentary's on, you're there. <laughs> okay, so come with me here for just a minute and we're going to get somewhere. The verses from the passage about the pool of Bethesda where it talks about the angel of the Lord stirring the waters and whoever stepped in first got healed are omitted in the earliest and most reliable manuscripts. Now, two pools are mentioned in the Gospel of John. The other one is the pool of Siloam, which is mentioned in John 9-7. And the second is the pool of Bethesda. Both have now been discovered by archaeologists clearly identified and it turns out the Pool of Bethesda does have five colonnades, just as the gospel describes. The Pool of Siloam, which is where, remember, Jesus made mud, mud and put it on the man's eyes and told him to go wash in the Pool of Siloam, and he was healed. That actually was a Jewish ceremonial washing facility associated with the temple in Jerusalem. This pool in Bethesda was not. This pool, there is evidence that this pool was part of what's called an Asclepion, which is a pagan healing center dedicated to the Greco-Roman god of well-being and health named Asclepius. There were more than 400 of them throughout the Roman Empire, 
and they were seen as the dispensers of this God, this pagan God's mercy toward the sick. In fact, Asclepius in mythology had two daughters, Hygieia and Panacea, where we get our modern words for hygiene and panacea. Snakes were also a part of this cult of healing and health. How was that going for them? I'm not sure. <laughs> if this is correct, I believe it is. You don't have to believe it is. I believe it is. If this is correct, it may change our perception of the entire story. These people were not waiting for the God of Israel to heal them, but rather for a pagan bubbling water act in a hospital of the day of which there were 400. And what seemed to happen was that the translators later, the, there's evidence that this cult of healing was widespread. Everybody at the time would know about it, but later copiers of the manuscripts thought, oh, that's confusing. This, this man had studied out these copiers. The original Greek, the original Aramaic was totally accurate, but later they didn't embellish or change, but they did add notes. And so somebody went, well, an angel was stirring the water. Again, you don't have to believe that, but that, it's such an amazing thing to think here. So the second century historian, Justin Martyr, mentions the obsession with Asclepius writing. He wrote this, the devil brings forth Asclepius as the raiser of the dead and healer of all diseases, but he is imitating the prophecies about Christ. Doesn't that sound just like what the enemy would do? Create a healing cult and a stirring of the waters and, a, and wouldn't Jesus walk right into that and go, hey, no, here, look away, I'm here. Doesn't that make so much more sense that he was presenting himself against a cultural backdrop and saying, listen, I'm just not a little dabble, do you? I'm not just another bubble or two. I'm not just a pool inserter. I am a whole other way of living. Oh, come away, come away with me. You don't even need these waters. You don't even need this place. You don't even need these systems of men. Come away. Let me demonstrate a completely new world right here on earth. Oh, that's what he's saying. Oh, it is possible, is it possible, that these lines about the angel of the Lord were added as an explanation about the stirring of the waters by the scribes trying to be helpful. The stirring up of the water, according to this scholar, and I can, anybody who cares, I can give you his name later. The stirring up of the water was likely happening when the priests of the Asclepius cult, and this is according to archaeological evidence, opened the connecting pipes between the higher and lower portions of the pool. The water in the upper reservoir would then flow into the lower portion of the pool and cause bubbles. And so they believed that if they got in first when it bubbled, they would be healed. Thus, it means even more that Jesus was absolutely bypassing the whole system and presenting himself as a completely different answer. Now, from that same article, I had to tell you all that to bring you here. From that same article, this is a straight quote. This is a powerful story. Sickness, the symbol of human chaos, was called into order by the power of Jesus' word. In the same way that pre-creation chaos was once called into the order of creation by Israel's heavenly king. Now, the royal son of Israel's God, Jesus, came into the pagan abode of the Asclepion and healed a Judean man without any magical formulas and spells. Yeah. Yeah. And performance-oriented Christians have accidentally been trying to put those in, back in. But Jesus is not doing that. It's simply his redemptive, finished work because of the work performed. Not just the sacraments or our modern-day sacraments of trying to have our heart right enough I've told y'all before, this is just me. I'm going to be telling it always. But I don't, you know, don't say, is your heart right? Is your heart really right? Is your heart really, really right? Don't do that to me because I will be going, I don't, I don't know. I deeper, I, 
Does anybody like me? Now, look, I know there's a heart right, but also know, you know, there's a, there's a way we pray for people, and, and you know you're done when you say, do you have peace? And I have just told people who've prayed for me, you will not be asking me that question. Because, yes, I know peace, but I can also, if you send me off looking, I'll find something else. I'm the court jester among you so that you can feel, wow, I'm better than her. So <laughs> take it, take it. I just want to tell you, this is an amazing thing. Without any magical formulas or spells, there's no juju magic in this stuff. This is the living God dealing with people in a real way. Jesus did so simply by telling the man to get up and walk. In other words, Jesus healed the man in the same way Israel's God once created the world, yeah. simply by the power of the spoken word. Yeah. And, and in all due respect to great teachers of the word, most of whom didn't really get it wrong, but a lot of the well-meaning followers did, speaking the word is not bubbling of the weird waters. It's just the recreation, the reenactment of the original creation. God said, let there be light. If you're made in his image, you say over your body, let there be light. It's not a spell. It's not superstitious. How many of you have done that thing? Listen, watch your words. Do not speak negative stuff over yourself. Don't do that because it's not true and your cells do hear it. But how many of you who've walked with God a while in this movement, have you ever just in a bad moment said, I always screw up, and then immediately you go, oh no, did I just release that over myself? <laughs> Come on, we've all done it. Don't go around saying bad stuff over yourself, but good grief, it's not superstition. God knows your heart, and he wants to cooperate you with you in releasing creative words that will heal you and bring you success. But we don't have to get all... You know, like, oh, I've been, con my confession's all over them. I'm not sorry. <laughs> what is that? And who are you drawn to Christianity with that behavior? This is fun, y'all. This is fun. We get to say, let there be light. We don't, we don't have to sit in the room and go, I refuse to say darkness. I refuse to say darkness. I am secure enough at this point in my life to not need to know why you're staring at me right now. <laughs> because I have spoken some things over myself. All right, I'm going to close here with an end-of-the-year challenge for you. Oh, by the way, isn't that, yeah, Jackie Chan's coming. Isn't that picture amazing? Some of you need to take that into your prayer relationship with God and just really believe. It's not... Yeah, we have power in our words, but the power is we are made in his image and he's the creator. If you start believing what you say has creative power, you won't have a problem controlling your mouth. Okay, here's the end of the year challenge. I believe that the Lord wanted to return us to thinking about unstuckness, and I felt to say this to you. If you have been more conscious of your stuckness this year, so there might be some among us. I have been here at times. I thought, Lord, we got this theme, living unstuck, and all I'm doing is seeing how many areas I'm stuck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If that's the case, maybe it's just that you're noticing it. Maybe it's just that you're coming alive to the possibilities beyond it. So take heart this morning if you're like, well, my church did this living unstuck, and I just feel like I'm more stuck. Nope, you're more conscious. Your aperture has started to widen. Now let's widen it all the way to see the provision of God. And I really believe, y'all, uh, for some odd reason, I've been thinking about insurance lately. And this is a bad analogy, but I'm going to make it anyway. I really believe, like, some of y'all need to get some things done while your deductible for this year is met. And I mean spiritually. In other words, you know about deductibles? You know that? There's no deductible in God. But I'm just saying, I feel like God's coming and saying, look, don't just coast into the next year. I want to do business with you. And you've gone through some things this year. Your deductible is met. Let's lean into how good can it be? How good can we? Don't just wait till January 1, 2020 and go, I'm going to start again. How good could we roll into 2020? What could he repair in us between now and January 1? Your deductible's met, my friend.
I'm taking this way too far. <laughs> this is coming out of the overflow of my own heart. <laughs> Get it done, man. Let's do it. Let's believe for it. Let's, let's go for it because Jesus is delivering you from all your fears by grace and declaring with his creative words, rise, take up your bed, all that you lay down on and walk. I'm asking myself, for some of the dreams and goals in my life, Perrin, what are you laying down on? Why are you not walking? What are you laying down on? Are you willing to pick up that mat and roll it up and get on your way? Are you willing to get up from 38 years of inactivity in various areas of my life? I'm saying yes to the Lord, but I'm also saying empower me to do that and make the desire to change so real in me that the pressure of staying the way I am becomes greater than the fear of moving ahead. Last slide. Jackie Chan was not originally on this slide, and then I thought he needed to be. In case you didn't, I need to signal you when your mind should be blown. <laughs> Just one more deep word dive, and we'll sum it up with this. Psalm 34, 4 says, you've probably heard this before, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Okay. If my aperture is that wide, I go, yes, sir, yes, sir, I sought the Lord. You know what I mean? Have you ever done that? Anybody here that's walked with the Lord a while and you're going, okay, I'm trying to insert that scripture in my head. <laughs> and your mind's really all over the place and you're going, every experience right now is fear. But hallelujah, I sought the Lord. <laughs> right? Okay, this is why I love God widening my aperture. I probably have looked up the Hebrew word for fear before, but maybe God makes you forget so you can be reintroduced. I don't know. I looked it up, and fear has, the Hebrew word for fear has two meanings. It can mean fear or a storehouse or granary. What? Those are two different things. It can be a fear or a barn. The root word, so it could have said, he delivered me from all my barns. The root word is ger, which means to sojourn, as in turn aside and kind of wander or tarry. How interesting is that? I got all over this, and all of a sudden my aperture widened. So look at my little summary paragraph. He is delivering me even from what I've stowed, stored up in my own sojourning. When I got off track and went wandering in my own math, and I have barns full of it, he can deliver me from that. I may have gathered into my own inner barns the wrong crops of thinking that is producing an orphan state of fear and keeping me stuck. Today, deliverance stands right in front of me, offering himself. No ritual of a bubbly pool, but him in the now, in all his fullness. He's saying, no matter where you've been wandering, no matter what you've stored up, I don't care if you've got crops and crops of wrong thinking, I am more than that. And I'm widening your aper aperture today so that you can let light on your situation and burn that grain of the Philistines. Be sure the burning bush you turn aside to see is actually on fire. <laughs> Don't turn aside and tarry with doubts and fears and your own conclusions or your own math. Recently, that was made so real to me. Turning aside to see the bush on fire is one of my favorite things. Tab and I go way back on that. We always talk about how Moses had to turn aside, which means if you just go, oh, I'm functioning, God's over here burning, and he's going, come away. Turn aside and see. But... The distractions in your life, they're not on fire. They're just turning you aside. Be sure that the bush you turn aside and see is actually on fire. God has a burning bush for you right now, right today. And a, there's no remedial stuff. God always meets us in the now. He may heal things from the past, but he always meets us in the now to do it. So I believe today as we close, there's such an opportunity. All, I, I believe all God wants to do is shift us forward in faith for this month, 
and this Christmas and this on into New Year. Uh, recently, when we had our artists gathering, I shared this thought came to me that the way that the enemy, when he hits us with something, it feels like we lean back on our heels, doesn't it? You know, when you get hit with the cares of life, the things that come against you, it just puts you in this, oh, I better lean back a little posture. And I feel like all God wants today is to help us start to lean forward. Start to lean forward into destiny. I know you've had disappointments. I know you've been through some things this year. I know maybe some of you got super excited about living unstuck and you had a list maybe and maybe you feel a lot of stuckness. But God is not through. And there's a forward leaning that he wants to ignite in your heart. Why don't you go ahead and stand and the worship team can come. And as we pray to close, I just want to invite you to widen your aperture. You have lenses that you've developed just by living life. And God wants to help you widen the aperture. If there's certain situations, I know some of you, every time we come together, there are certain people that are just carrying heavy situations. And we're always conscious of that. For you, God wants to say, I have more light. No matter how many times you've been over it and over it, God has something to show you. Some of you have so many distractions in the background from things that have just been like buzzing bees. Sometimes it's like almost, you're not literally hearing voices, but you just feel like it's a constant. Your, your mind, your own mind and analysis can wear you out. Today there's a grace to focus on Jesus and what he's saying to you. So Father, I just pray that as we're standing here today, that by your Holy Spirit you would communicate to each person what you have for them. Father, I pray that each one of them would be graced to lean back forward. Father, you're not mad at us. You're not condemning us. You're not disappointed in us if we've leaned back and we're not pressing in. You know. You remember our frame. You know what we're made of. You know what we faced. But today, I feel the shifting of the Holy Spirit. Take heart, Abbey Church. God is still committed to you living unstuck. To you getting and living unstuck story's not over. And this holiday season, wow, how many of you right now are getting a faith that you don't have to just coast into this holiday season exhausted? God's got purpose for every day of your existence. There is not a day of your life, every one of you, for which God doesn't have purpose. So just reach out to him and receive that. Holy Spirit, we release you. Father, I thank you that you're healing throughout this auditorium. We release every kind of healing to every person that calls the Abbey home, whether they're watching live, whether they're watching or listening to the podcast later. We just declare this could be their moment of getting unstuck in the place they've been stuck. Love to be.